Okay, hi, hello, I'm, uh, I'm Alex. Um, I'm going to present uh, Monique's task. It's an alternative to future, or let's say I, I consider it a complementary, and it's an, an alternative to Scala Z task. I'm actually quite nervous because I've seen, you know, faces from the community. This is the first time I'm meeting you and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh shit, I'm in front of smart people and I have to convince you that I'm s saying the truth. Um, yeah. So, um, I've been working on Monix for some time in parallel with the project we've been um, working on uh, at work. Uh, it's a project that evolved uh, based on, on current needs that we have. Uh, I consider it a library for composing asynchronous programs, and uh, what it does, it exposes, first of all, the observable pattern uh, imported from uh, erics.net and erics Java, uh, but, you know, with the Scala twist, it's, it's, in, it's uh, imported in a, in, I consider it idiomatic, although that's subjective. But um, anyway, and now version two, which is at release candidate, um, it, it, it exposes task. Um, it, it's it's an it's a project that's accepted in type level uh, incubator, and um, you know it's it's really hard to to come up with a presentation for 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 um, uh, Monix because every time I try doing that, I remember I still have work to do. Like when when I <laughs> when, when I started these slides, this was at milestone two, <laughs> and uh, I I started the release process for 2.0, and I'm fixing bugs and I'm porting uh, our our uh, internal code base to use the version two from version one. Um, I, I I care very much about st stability and so on, but. Uh, I, I don't want to declare it 2.0 unless it's stable and we've had internal changes anyway. So um, let's talk a little about evaluation in Scala. What does evaluation mean? Well, uh, Scala is really an eager language. Um, usually uh, eager means that the expression gets evaluated as soon, uh, e even before um, it's, it's, it's uh, bound to a name and um, uh, lazy evaluation in Scala is usually modeled by means of function. Lazy meaning that uh, the results uh, of, of, of an expression are, are uh, um, computed on a by need basis when you need them. And um, the, the, the details differ depending on implementation. I would mention here lazy val or by name parameters, except that by name parameters and lazy val is it's something that the compilers can understand, but we cannot express with the Scala type system. So we can only express function zero. So in case we want to, you know, return a lazy something from a function, we can only return functions. Um, and that's okay, but note that here, the detail, the internal implementation um, can, can do memoization like it can, it, can, it can cache the result for subsequent evaluations, or it cannot. So, uh, you know, it depends on the implementation. Um, but there's something that's usually missing uh, from, from, let's say, other equivalent platforms. Scala has, and, you know, main, uh, most mainstream platforms, on most mainstream platforms, we can also talk about the synchronous evaluation, meaning that what does a synchronous mean? It means um, expressions, effects, expre expressions being evaluated or effects being triggered by a process that's, that's outside our, our uh, current process. Um, it can mean something that gets evaluated on another machine on the network. It can mean something that gets evaluated on another thread. And so, um, but we, we still want access to, to, the, to the result of things that get executed asynchronously. And, you know, asynchronous evaluation is actually the mother of all evil on top of the JVM because uh, asynchronous implies um, non-determinism and 
because it implies non-determinism, you have to uh, uh, reason about ordering, so uh, we, we have to deal with concurrency. Um, so, um, you know, it's... And uh, we, if we want to model it with, with a type, like with a primitive type, this is basically the, the observer pattern, like from the gang of four. It's something that receives a callback, and, and when that external process finishes processing whatever it does, then it going to, it's going to call your callback with the result, informing you of the result of that computation. Um, we cannot distinguish between eager and lazy evaluation when, when, uh, when describing this. But I consider future, Scala's standard future, to be about eager evaluation. And task, uh, it's about lazy evaluation. Eager because future, um, you know, future is weird. Uh, <laughs> it's future, um, um, I, I, I once saw like a, a, like a thread of discussion on, on Twitter where everybody is, and um, Victor was saying that he doesn't like how futures uh, get um, um, described as being, as representing running computations. Um, a future is basically a value wannabe. Of course, it's, it's, it's kind of a po poetic notion, you know, a value detached from time because you have to understand what value is and uh, what time has to do with values. Um, Rich Hecke has a good presentation about it. Um, but anyway, moving on. Usage, um, when, when comparing task and future, it's kind of similar at places. Um, where uh, for future you import an execution context being the low level thing that runs stuff. Uh, for task, we've got scheduler, which is still an execution context, only enhanced. Um, and um, if if we want to if we want to you know execute something you know uh, something really important like one plus one um, <clears throat> and execute it on another thread uh, apply will do that for us. The difference will be that um, when applying the constructor for future it's going to send a runnable in a thread pool immediately, whereas the task does not trigger any effects. Uh, when doing that. The task only triggers effects like sending, starting a tram, uh, an evaluation trampoline or, or sending tasks in, in a thread pool only when doing run async. Run async is like uh, if, you know, if you know the I.O. type from, from Haskell, uh, run async is the equivalent of unsafe perform I.O. Um, it, it's something that can be done at the, the end of the world, let's say. So, effects that happen, happen here, not before it. Um, and th this is like uh, a, a different, I mean, uh, for, for future, we, we send a runnable here in the thread pool, and we send the run another runnable here uh, when, when the future is complete, and we need to execute another on, on complete runnable. So, future really tries to be eager. It really tries to, I mean, when you receive a future, uh, um, you don't, need to run anything on it because at some point you'll have that value because it's eager. Okay, um, task, it's on a binary basis. Um, this is the main difference. Um, so, um, I, I'll show you that task also allows a more fine-grained control over the evaluation model. Um, as I said, doesn't trigger any effects until run async. Um, doesn't necessarily execute stuff on another logical thread. Um, feature is really inefficient, like when, when, when triggering a map or a flat map on it, uh, or whatever um, it's going to send, um, for, for each of those operations it's going to send a non-complete handler to execute in, in a runnable in the thread pool, and it's, it, it's actually not okay for, for CPU-bound operations. Uh, and another thing um, that task does, once you execute it, it allows you to, can to cancel it uh, for reasons that 
have to do with uh, non-determinism that become apparent when working with observables, actually. It's really important to cancel asynchronous stuff, I think. Um, this is something that Scalar's task doesn't do. Um, not sure. This is like the, fa the face of one of my colleagues when I tried explaining this, but um, <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm doing like <laughs> a better job. So, um, what task supports us as builders? Um, we can have, you know, like strict evaluation task now is the equivalent of future successful. It's something that's already initialized. The value is already known when you run a sync on it. You already know the value. Eval once is the equivalent of a lazy val, meaning that it does memoization. Um, I like the term memoization, and I'm not a native English speaker, by the way. Memoization comes from dynamic programming, uh, whatever. And it's, uh, it's close to a Romanian word, so. Uh, eval always is the equivalent of a function. Uh, it will um, try to execute synchronously uh, if the execution model permits. I'll talk about that in a moment. Defer uh, transforms any expression that returns a task into a, a lazy task. It defers the evaluation. And fork guarantees that we um, fork uh, guarantees that we have asynchronous execution. So we are forcing an asynchronous boundary. We are, we are sending a runnable in the thread pool. Um, um, this is useful when we try, when we have like um, computationally, computationally expensive stuff and we really need it to execute on another thread for some reason. Uh, again, memoization. So, um, eval once is not the only way to memoize, to memoize this stuff. Um, you can take any task and memoize it, uh, meaning that uh, it executes uh, once and its result is going to be available for subsequent evaluations. And you've got guaranteed idempotency, potency, meaning that if you have side effects in there, you uh, are guaranteed for those effects to be executed only once. Um, so, um, and there's actually a talk to be had of memoize versus run async. Run async actually has three overloads. One of them returns a future um, because it's nice to transform a, a task um, into a future, and a future really does memoization on its own. So, uh, but the difference is that this one is lazy, this one is going to be strict because future is strict. Um, moving forward, in Scala we can do, you know, tail recursive loops. So this is nice. I mean, whenever I, I, I participate in talks about Scala and functional programming for beginners, this comes up. But, um, I mean, this, this does have utility. It, it allows, you know, functional programmers to, uh, to describe loops without using vars. Uh, it's, it's nice, you know, but um, we, we, we can, first of all, we can do that in future. This is one way to describe, um, by the way, this is doing something really important. It's calculating a Fibonacci series, right? So it, it, goes, it goes into a loop and, um, you know, returns at some point into the nth Fibonacci number in sequence. Um, we can describe it using task. This is one way of doing it. <coughs> we can use now when, when we, we have a final result or we can use defer, defer to stop eager evaluation basically to transform it into a lazy evaluation. But of course, we can also use flat map and on, on things like task and future flat map really is the operation that describes recursivity. And this is going to uh, be um, tail recursive. Um, well, it's going to use hep space instead of stack space, called stack space. <coughs> and it's going to use constant space, so it's, it's, um, it's efficient. It's not going to blow up. Um, so yeah, I mean, and the, of course the, the, the difference between uh, 
the difference with future here is that future is going to send tasks in, in the thread pool for, for every iteration. Um, task will not. So depending on the evaluation model that I'll talk about in a second. <coughs> but of course, because we are talking about recursivity, we can talk about mutually, uh, mutual tail recursion, and this is the um, this is important in functional programming because with this you can describe state machines. Um, in this example, it's a stupid example. It tests if the number is even or not, but uh, we are describing a state machine of two states, odd or even, and it jumps between them. So functions represent states in a state machine, and it jumps between them. And um, if you describe this using standard you know, function calls in Scala, it's going to blow up with a stack overflow. Uh, it's not going to do that with task, of course. So, you know, task really is about lazy evaluation. Um, I mentioned at the beginning scheduler. Scheduler um, is an enhanced execution context. Um, the execution context from Scala allows you to uh, send runnables in a thread pool, but we, we actually need more. We need to execute tasks with a delay, uh, which it, it, it's what schedule once does. This is the equivalent of a scheduled de um, executor service from Java. I don't remember the name because it's so complicated. But it allows you to, to schedule tasks runnables for execution with a given delay. Um, also, when doing things based on time, it's actually cool to have a way to inject uh, time because, you know, time represents usually, sometimes time represents input from the world and you, we use system dot current time milis. <clears throat> but there's no way to override that because it's a singleton. And if you do testing, it's, it's like so hard to test without having a way to inject a time generator. So scheduler does this um, current time milis, executes the current time, uh, returns the current time in milliseconds since the app watch and you're supposed to use it. And the execution model, I'm going to talk about it in a second, and this can be expressed in terms of schedule ones. Basically, a scheduler is, scheduler is the minimum requirement needed to execute stuff asynchronously, and it's supported on top of JavaScript and Scala.js because, you know, it does the same thing. Set timeout in, in Scala.js Scala and JavaScript does the same thing. Um, and, you know, the execution model, I mentioned that task doesn't necessarily uh, execute things um, in, in threads. What it does by default, it, it's executed things in batches. So, um, the the, the default the default look kind of looks kind of like this. It does have a default, so the default is batched execution with a batch size set to something. I don't remember the exact value. Let's say it's uh, a thousand. So what it's going to do is that the the round loop is going to execute a maximum of one thousand uh, iterations and then force an asynchronous boundary. Um, this is important. Uh, because on top of the JVM, when we, you have um, thread pools that are limited to a few threads, to, a, to a, a number of threads directly proportional to the number of cores you have, or on top of JavaScript where you don't have threads at all, it's important to be cooperative. This is basically for doing cooperative multi-threading. I mean, you, you don't block the run loop for too long. You, you leave the chance for other things to run. So you, you execute a batch, um, you introduce an asynchronous boundary, and so on. So this is what task does by default. Um, but you can also choose to always execute a thing, so whatever it does to send a runnable in a thread pool, just like Scala's future, for whatever reason, maybe this is a proper default. 
or you know to always prefer synchronous if possible um, this is the mode of operation for the task in Scala Z um, and of course until now we've talked about evaluations that can happen synchronously but those weren't really asynchronous as I said this is the type I mean unit here unit here what can you expect this doesn't describe like anything um, I mean this just screams non-determinism right um, and what we do, on top of the JVM at least, is that we try to pretend that such functions exist. Uh, we do this by means of compiler tricks, like what Scala Sync does, or we do this by blocking threads. You know blocking threads, it's incredibly dangerous because it's, it's, um, it's error prone because you have to know and control the underlying thread pool. For example, the default global from Scala has a maximum, uh, has an upper limit on the number of threads it can spawn. So even if you use the blocking context and you're a good citizen and so on, you can still have all the threads in that thread pool blocked and so there will be no more threads left for completing those callbacks. So you can end up in a deadlock. Um, so um, it's it's like a really error-prone operation, and like it's also impossible on top of JavaScript. And I think you know Scala has an incredible opportunity to be cross-platform, especially with Scala JS. And we should simply stop pretending that you know this is possible. Um, so here's how you can turn something. Uh, asynchronous, like really asynchronous um, in, in, um, into a task. We have the create builder that injects for us the scheduler and the callback to be called when, um, when the result is ready. Uh, in this case, we are turning a future into a task. Um, and, um, you know, on complete, um, we call either on success or on error. Futures cannot be uh, canceled, so we won't pretend that they can be canceled in this case. Um, but we are supposed to return a cancelable here that mm, in some cases can cancel the computation. Um, of course, we already have the from future helper to help us. Um, and uh, because I, I, I don't like binary parameters, from future takes an eager value, an eager future value, so you have to use defer on it if you want it to be a factory of futures. And you know, we can turn we can turn a future into a task using from future, and we can turn a task into a future by using run async, right? It's going to return a future. And you know, we can block for the result, but I already said that we shouldn't do that. But you know, in case we want to block, you know, um, it's better to use so wait result, so I didn't try to outsmart the Scala's uh, standard library because uh, using the block context and specifying a really explicit timeout is really healthy when blocking. Um, so, you know, one, de one design trait of cancelable of task is that I've made it cancelable. So upon evaluation, uh, if it's synchronous, then it should be canceled if possible. So, um, these are the three uh, overrides of run async. One returns a future, but it's a cancelable future. This is a type described also in Monix. It inherits from future. I mean, it's common sense if, if from, to go from future to cancelable future. It's just one step, right? <laughs> and you know, we can have you, we can have um, callbacks like with oncomplete and sidestep the whole future thing. As I said, cancelable future inherits from future with cancelable just exposes the cancel method that um, communicates to the producer that um, cancellation is desired. It's just, it's just a guideline. It's not forced. If the thread is running, it's not going to kill the thread, God forbid. So, um, you know, and when doing eval once delay execution run as sync, we can change our mind later. And you know, when doing cancel on it, 
it's going to really cancel it uh, because this uh, this does a schedule once in the scheduler and um, we we are, we are going to clean up our after ourselves if we if we cancel. Um, here's how to describe something that needs to be evaluated but with a delay, right? So we we uh, register a, a task in in our scheduler with a delay and we execute the callback like in that runnable. And schedule once already returns a cancel, uh, cancelable that we can use to cancel the computation in case we, we change our mind. So if we, if we do like a delayed evaluation over in 10 seconds from now, uh, and we change our mind in one second from now, then we can cancel and it's going to clean up the resources, you know, used in, in the thread pool. Um, and this is where this helps. Um, so when we are speaking about asynchronous execution, we are speaking about non-determinism. And this is one example. So we've got choose first of task one and task two. And we are creating a race condition. And one of them is going to finish first. And we can, it's going to return either an A, if A finish first, and the can Chalable future for the second task, or in case B finished first, is going to return B and the cancelable future for A. This is a neither here. I was, you know, fancy with this sign here. <laughs> so, um, and this helps you when you want to uh, fall back or you, when you want to time out, because when you receive that result, is there, is there left or right? You can clean up. I mean, uh, you can cancel the other one, um, and like task has a timeout on it, trigger a timeout exception in case task doesn't finish in 10 seconds or whatever. And it's described in terms of choose first step, and you can do that because we can cancel the other one. Of course, we don't really need to cancel. We can just, you know, let it be. We can just let it, you know, be garbage collected or whatever, or we can use its result. Um, in case we, we change our mind or something, but you know we can cancel it. I mean, um, and this this I think in in such cases this is important because we want to clean up our, after ourselves here. So I mean this, this in this example we have a fallback that is gets triggered in five seconds from now. If the first task finishes first, then the fallback will never execute because it's getting cancelled. Um, this leads to a better future sequence. Future sequence, if you remember, um, transforms a sequence of futures into a, a future of list of, into a future of sequence, right? Um, zip list from task will, um, on error, cancel everything immediately. It's not going to wait until everything is, is completed. Um, you know, it's and um, first complete of, again, just first complete will, will, will simply pick a winner and, and cancel the rest. Um, I mean, again, this is another case where canceling things is, I think it's important when, when you create a race condition between multiple tasks and you pick one. Um, Of course, we've got the usual flat map, you know, on task, and we can do four comprehensions, but we can do also zip on it, and this runs potentially in parallel, and there are overloads. I mean, there are variants up to six parameters on zip, so you can do stuff like this, and the, if these are asynchronous, then they will run in parallel, potentially, right, depending on the execution model and so on. Um, Here's one thing where tasks get interesting versus future. Future does not describe the function. Future is not a specification, but task is. Meaning that task can be restarted at will, right? It can be retried until we get what we want. And this one restarts until the random number that we get is, you know, divisible by two. Um, and, you know, there's... There's this school of thought in 
functional programming, I think, that error handling for exceptions shouldn't be, you know, um, handled by something like task, but I think that when it comes to asynchronous execution, errors are especially problematic because, um, you know, it can have, an error can get triggered on a thread somewhere and you won't catch it and it's not going to generate a sound. And I think um, proper error handling for task is incredibly important. So, you know, you've got the usual on error handle with. This is uh, similar to the handle with from future. I like on error because I'm a Java programmer. I like to, you know, have really explicit naming. <laughs> so, um, we can restart. I mean, we can restart the task after a maximum of, uh, with a maximum retries in case it generates an error. Um, we can restart with the condition. In case it's a timeout exception, restart. Otherwise, no, just trigger the error. Um, but of course, if, if we are doing like HTTP request when the server has problems, it's a really bad idea to restart immediately. So maybe you want to do exponential back off or something. So, you know, you can describe something like, um, a retry with a maximum retries count and a delay that gets doubled every time. So, you know, it's going to retry um, with a delay of one second, then two seconds, then four seconds, then eight seconds. Maybe it's something you want to not overwhelm the server exactly when it has problems. <coughs> this is recursive, by the way. It's doing a recursive call here. It's okay. Um, and it has a timeout on it. This is something that I really missed in future. You know, if something, um, if something doesn't complete in 10 seconds, then time it out, uh, like interrupt it. <coughs> and it misses because, you know, execution context doesn't have the means to execute something with a delay. So that's the purpose of scheduler, which is why it's needed. You know, execution context is a little too simplistic. Um, so, okay, here I went a little overboard. <laughs> um, I think I'm out of time, but um, I'll go fast. You know, uh, this is something inspired a little by, um, and it's 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 still a work in process, and it's inspired by by the Katzi Val. Um, I like this word Koval because it's it's the synonym for synchronous. And I would like to say that it's the dual of eval, but there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, you know, um, and um, really what I, what I wanted to express was a task that has, uh, because, because task can be many things, I wanted a task that can evaluate synchronously, that is guaranteed to evaluate synchronously, like immediately. And, you know, this is like Quavel, and because, you, as I said, I'm a Java developer, I started with an inheritance. Quavel um, would be inheriting from task because it has a restriction. This thing has to compete synchronously, but then I, I ended up with two flat map versions, and so I described them separately, only to be bound later by a type class or something. Um, and you've got the same exactly the same builders and utilities as on task, except the ones that um, are about um, asynchronous execution, so no delay execution or timeout or stuff. But, you know, error handling and the builders and the memoization, it's all there. So, you know, <laughs> again, with a surprised face. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool uh, because it can function as a replacement for by name parameters and a replacement for lazy val and a replacement for function zero and it's stack safe. And again, the mutually recursive loop that I described earlier running with coeval. Um, and, you know, conversion between them is, is easy. This is another thing I thought it's necessary to do. I mean, 
Tasks are by nature asynchronous, but some task instances can be evaluated immediately, so why not have the means to discover if it can be evaluated or not right now, so we can you know, turn it into a quaver, which is going to generate an either future or already evaluated value. Um, and, you know, the conversion from quaver to task is immediate and quite efficient because they are using, like, the same states. I mean, they have shared implementation. I copy-pasted stuff. It's annoying. <laughs> And now we, we can we can like have this quaver here in this table, which is nice. I mean, I want this thing to write monics all over it, um, and uh, we can we can we can do experiments like describe a cons list. Like we have a head and a tail. Like this is a normal list, but we can say that the tail is quaver, and we can we can control the evaluation. If it's a quaver now, then it's going to behave like a list because it's eager. If it's if it's evil once, then it's going to behave like a stream. Or if it's evil always, then it's going to behave like you know an iterable. But we can also say that the tail is a task, and this is interesting because this stream is asynchronous. Um, but it's pool-based. The, the model is, you know, interesting and it's something that I wanted to explore except that I went overboard and described an evaluable type class and then I ended up with a const stream that, you know, has an evaluable tail and something about it felt dirty, but we can, you can do this, like you can have a stream that either uses quaver or task and behave asynchronously or not. So uh, this was an interesting experiment. It's, it didn't make it to Monix because it felt dirty. Um, I don't know much theory, but I have a nose, so yeah. So, yeah. Yes. So for the cancellation, it seems like it's important that you frequently either flat map or defer or something like that to give it. Is that how you create the point where it will be canceled? Like Yeah, uh, yeah. So, the, what is what is the so the question is what is the mechanism uh, by which we ensure that things are cancelable? Th some things are not cancelable. In case we go into a loop, into a flat map loop, we 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 do an if on a boolean is cancelled, but only on on asynchronous boundaries because uh, checking that boolean is incredibly expensive because it's a volatile. So uh, it, it gets, if, if it's batched execution, it gets checked every 1,000 iterations or something. Um, so yeah, so flat map, a loop with described with, with flat map is ca cancelable and it gets checked on asynchronous boundaries when, when things are sent to the thread pool. It can be called in line. It's it's uh, configurable with the execution model. I mean, if it's a task that does an addition, like something incredibly important, why execute another thread? But we can configure it. You know? Use the default async execution model there. Is it, uh, the default is batched execution, and the first iterations are not going to be executed asynchronously. Yes, that's memoization. Um, it's it's a it's simpler because a task only generates a value when you when you evaluate it, um, and it does memoization and it's going to serve that value for subsequent, you know, evaluations. The same as they are in, in on the JVM. It's it's the same code base, 
um, uh, the, the implementation uh, is it's inspired by the free monad, meaning we've got an internal trampoline, and when, when it hits, when it hits on a synchronous state that cannot be executed synchronously, then it forks. And, but no blocking whatsoever. <laughs> so, <laughs> no countdown latches. Yes? Um, I, I forgot to repeat the question. So the, the, the question is if, if um, um, task respects the blocking context in the same way as future, right? Um, so task outsources that to future. We have no blocking things on task. Task is not unawaitable, but you can do a run async on it and transform it into a future, and you can block on that future. Um, I mentioned that in a slide, um, so you can, I, I, I preferred to, to, to piggyback on the standards library way of blocking, so it respects, you know, the blocking context, and I really, really like explicit timeouts. Yes? Um, so if, if Monix has any dependencies right now, no third-party dependencies. Um, um, I, I'm, still, I'm still wondering whether uh, Monix should depend on cats, but uh, it, there's the question of should it depend on cats at the bottom of the stack or at the top? You know, cats should be on top or at the bottom. Right now it has no dependencies, and I quite like that. Uh, besides Synchron, Synchron is a project that was, you know, stripped from Monix, so it's like the same project, but the sub-project, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Yes? I shamelessly copied the cat's eval, and I think I'm more strict about error handling. I, I simply, I mean, really, the, the whole, the, why I really wanted coeval uh, is because of this. I wanted to transform, um, you know, um, a task into something that might be either a future or something that's already evaluated because I don't want blocking, right? I hate blocking. So, but some tasks are executed immediately, so I wanted this. <laughs> and, you know, I ended up with Coeval. Um, I, I had like an internal conflict inside me, trust me. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. No more questions? <laughs>